All right, Martin. I've given you co-host control, so the floor is yours. Yes. Let me share my screen. So does everybody see my screen? And does everybody hear me? Yep, sure, sure do. Nice. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, why delivering on time is overrated. And that sounds, uh, it's a very spicy statement and it sounds probably quite controversial, but I hope by the end of this talk, you will understand it. Well, well you'll agree with me that it's actually quite reasonable and uh, uh, I will do my best to explain it as well as possible. So before I start, right, just a quick introduction. So I've been building around products for around 10 years in various roles. So I actually studied biology. Uh, I have a master's in functional genomics. I didn't do anything with computer science during my studies. Um, I got in IT because of the crisis. I was not able to find a job and in IT, yeah, they were looking for people. Um, I actually introduced Scrum at the fastest growing startup in the Netherlands and I moved all of their teams to feature teams. I've written many medium articles. I'm also busy writing a book on sprint goals with Addison Wesley in my cone series. And I'm currently head of product at Rodeo. So I'm also still a product owner. So I'm still active with the teams. I'm still in the trenches. So to get started, most of the time, if you join a company, you will find out they care about two things. Is it delivered on time, the timelines, and is it working exactly as we expect? So the requirements. And what I would like to challenge is, are these two things really that important? And, and to put it in a much nicer way, in the, uh, I mean, Seth Godin always finds a way of expressing things way nicer than I can, just because it is easy to measure, uh, doesn't make it important. And to give you an example, so this is actually from gaming. So some of you might recognize this screenshot. So uh, in 1996, two ex-Microsoft M2Es founded a gaming company called Valve. And they started, they were actually, uh, they sold their Microsoft stock. So they actually were pretty flush with money and they decided to build their first game. So the good news was they had money. The bad news is they only had a game, one game that they're working on, there was no cash coming in. And they were working super hard with a small group of people making over hours. And they were finally ready to release this game in December of 1997. But before they decided to release, they actually found out from playtesting the game wasn't fun. And now, the, of course, the difficult question became, what should we do? Because basically, they had no reputation. They, they, would, they already announced to the world that they were going to release. So now they had the option of releasing a shitty game or backpedaling, losing their reputation and not having a lot of money, right? I mean, they, they didn't have cash flow. They did have some money. And actually, what did Valve do? They actually decide, delayed this game not only once, not only twice, they delayed it three times. So it was delayed until the summer of 1998. And what they actually did is they uh, looked at every level in the game, every weapon, and they reworked and tweaked everything. And this actually led to the unique cable design process, which you can Google. It's a very interesting way of working, which is unique to Valve. And they ultimately released the game in September of 1998. And by now, some of you uh, should know this game, Half-Life. So this was actually the best-selling shooter game of all time. And to give you a bit more context, this was also the reason my mother was worried about me, because basically I was playing all these games. I was not focusing on school. My grades were dropping. I was playing all these modification, Counter-Strike, Team Fortress Classic. But this game was a massive, massive, massive hit. So what's interesting, Valve continued work making games. And Valve actually is a very big name in gaming. They're world famous for, for releasing all these high quality games. They are great people working there. And actually this is from their developer wiki. And they actually poke fun at the fact that they are not able to release on time. So you can see uh, in this screenshots, all these different kinds of games that all became massive successes like Half-Life and they never delivered on time. They always delayed it multiple times. And of course, you might be thinking, okay, that's Valve, right? Maybe other companies can do it better. So here's another example. So those of you who used to have an N64, an Nintendo 64. So when GoldenEye came out, that was also a game which was revolutionary. I remember 
vividly talking to kids in my class about it. Like you can play with four people on your uh, with each other on the same TV. It was awesome. Uh, what's interesting is this multiplayer option was actually added in the last month without the permission of management. So and they were already late. So uh, that was it was a decision made by some developers. And by the time the management find out found out, they were like, yeah, we need to go live. So we're just going to include it. And uh, one example how you can notice this is in the game. Uh, the, the you can you have remote minds that you can place. They actually are not uh, the, the sorry. The people don't respond randomly. There's a set order. So basically, if someone dies, you can put the mine on the next place where they come, and they will never respawn, and you'll win the game. So this is an example of something that was missed because of this. So another example is of course uh, Miyamoto. So for those who don't know him, you definitely know the games like Mario, Donkey Kong, Zelda, and many more. And I can also tell you if you look into these games, many of them were also delayed. And he actually uh, has this very famous quote, quote, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad. Of course, now you might be thinking, my po the point I'm trying to make that being late is a good thing. That's not my point, right? This, so this is another example. This is Duke Nukem Forever, for those who are familiar in gaming. So Duke Nukem Forever was the follow-up of Duke Nukem 3D, which is a super popular, massive, successful game. And this game was 15 years in development, and it is a childhood trauma. I was waiting for it for many years, and then I played it, and it was terrible, terrible, terrible. They should never have released it. Of course, they wanted to make some money. So that's not the point I'm trying to make. And of course, you might also be thinking, yeah, we're talking a lot about games, but I'm not in gaming. So how does this relate to what I'm doing? Well, fair point. So uh, if you look at non-gaming examples is, um, so this is actually from Bill Amanian Ageling. He wrote an article about, uh, it's from a payments company. So basically the way I imagine it is they were, um, uh, so basically they have a digit which identifies how many clients you can have. So 9,999 clients were possible because they had four digits. And I imagine the developers sitting in a room and thinking, well, this should be good enough for now. And if it isn't, by the time we need to change it, we'll be filthy rich. So let's worry about it later. And what actually happened is this cost this company many, many, many months to fix this. And, and, and this is so surprising because this seems such a small change and they were completely unable to predict and out of control why, when it will be done. So if you want to hear all the details of why that was the case, I can recommend you to read the article. But this is just another example of something which seems quite simple, just increase the number of digits, but it isn't simple at all. So yeah, so why can't we deliver on time? That's the, the key question. Why is it so difficult? And that's because building software products is complex work. So we, when we start, we simply don't have enough information about what we need to do, how it will work. There's just simply too much uncertainty, too, much, too many things unclear. And whatever we predict is limited to what we know at that point, which we know isn't enough. And this is also why any requirement will never be perfect because it's always limited to what you know at the time. So the way I, I phrase it is being book smart won't cut it. You need to get your hands dirty. You need to, to balance like looking ahead and also thinking about what you're discovering. It's about this balance, this mix. And as well, like if you're trying to deliver on time, that's trying to predict the future based on coffee grounds. So in Dutch, we call this coffee dick kijker, right? So basically, if you look at this, this, this cup, there are some coffee grounds in there, but it lacks information to be able to conclude your future. And it's the same thing. When you make a prediction about timelines, often there just isn't enough signal. You don't have enough information. So trying to deliver on time is like predicting the future based on looking at your coffee grounds. So that's why I believe living on time is overrated because delivering a feature still takes the same amount of time regarding whatever your perception is whenever you make your estimate. And it's just our expectations based on this initial thinking that create this perception that we're late. And if you deliver on time based on your initial prediction, assuming you're doing complex work, right? That's a key thing. That means you got lucky. And that's like correctly predicting, predicting that you throw heads with a coin. It's nothing to be that proud of. So what should we be doing instead, right? So we, you might agree, okay, I can get there. It makes sense. So we're always watching the weather guy or the weather woman on the news. 
And they're almost always wrong, especially when they predict the future, the weather more than two weeks ahead of time. So what you actually see is that the weather more than one week ahead of time drops to 50% accuracy. But every day we listen to them on the news, they're still telling and we find it super important. But the reality is they, are, they, are, they cannot guarantee. And that's also why if you plan your wedding day, always have a plan B, even if it's 99% sure that the weather is gonna be amazing. So what should we be doing instead? So if you look at the weathermen, what they do is they forecast and update the timelines. Every day that passes on, they have more and better information. And that's the same thing we should be doing. And that still doesn't mean we'll be on time, but that still, but it does mean that we'll have a way better understanding and a way more accurate prediction. So to be more clear, like, uh, so this is a very old the PDCA cycle, which probably uh, uh, well, most of you will be familiar with. So what you actually see is every time in a sprint, we go through this cycle, right? So we make a plan. And as you can see in red, our plans are imperfect because we lack information. Then we execute the plan with a whole team. And sometimes we also need other teams. And we make mistakes either through communication or because we wrote down the wrong, wrong thing. We made a mistake. There can be many reasons. And then even if our plans are perfect and our actions are perfect, it still might not produce the expected results. There will still be, might be more to it. And that's why the green part is super important, this inspecting and adapting, right? Based on what you learn, adjusting your plan and your actions. And the shorter you can make this feedback loop, the better. So that's why if I, if I were to define agility, it's finding out this right balance of this foresight and this afterthought. So acting based on what you know now, so making plans, actions, uh, based on what you know at the moment, and afterthought. So basically responding based on what you discover. So the way I always phrase it is, when you do Scrum or you use an agile way of working, the key thing is to work with what you know to figure out what you don't know. And the key thing is, what you know. We overestimate how much we know. And we think we know a lot more than we do. And I think this also has to do with our education system. So if you look at university or at school, they basically tell you, this is the, this is the, the test. Here's a book. If you study the book perfectly, you're going to, you can get 100%. All the information is in there. But the problem is, this is not how it works in the real world. And another problem is, you get grades. So everybody wants to make zero mistakes. But the key thing is, if you know you don't have enough information, you, you can guarantee that you make mistakes. And it's not about preventing these mistakes, but about being able to learn from them quickly. So to go back to the original statement, so most companies care about two things. Is it delivered on time? It's kind of out of your control. Is it working exactly as you initially specified from the beginning? Impossible. Do these two things really matter? In my opinion, they don't. But of course, that begs the question, what does matter? So to, to tie it back to the original example, so this is a screenshot of Half-Life. So what matters most is how sure are, are you that what you're building is any good? So to go back to Valve, right? They didn't release any game yet. They were working on Half-Life. They actually did a lot of play testing. And they actually found out, that's how they found out the game isn't good enough, the people don't like it. And they actually, what they did is they made a very small level where they introduced many game mechanics and enemies just to see, hey, what can we do to make it fun? And they discovered quite some cool things which they could use. And these things gave them confidence, hey, if we have more time, we can do something really amazing. And that's the key thing, because they had really had confidence, hey, we're onto something. This, is, this game can be really, really good. That's why they had the guts to postpone. And of course, they had the money to do it, right? I mean, they, they, had, uh, they were flush with money from these Microsoft stocks that were sold. And if I look at an example of, of and this is not relating to software, of people that do this really well, or a profession that does this really well, comedians. So if you look at comedians, imagine Ricky Gervais would need to give a show nine months from now. He's not going to sit in a room and, and make a show on paper and write everything down and, and plan everything. No, he, he, he's going to prepare a show and he's going to give it for a small audience. And he's going to see which jokes are working, which aren't. And if they don't work, why? Maybe the joke is bad. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just the delivery. But 
this feedback is super important because you need to have confidence that, that the jokes you're making are funny. So that's why I would like to make it's like building features like doing stand-up comedy. Uh, build, delivering features doesn't mean you are delivering value, just as like telling a joke doesn't mean people will laugh. It's all about how it is received and if it helps your, the customer meet their goals. And what's also very important is most features you build are going to suck. That should be your starting point. And every feature you build is innocent of delivering value until you can hand over evidence to prove otherwise. Okay, that sounds very cool, but how do you do that? So what's very important is, and this is a very lovely quote for, from Katie Shera. Uh, so a product, it's about upgrading user. It's not about your product. People don't want a better camera. They, they want to be a better photographer. Another example is, which you probably are familiar with. So uh, people don't want a quarter inch uh, drill bit, they want a quarter inch hole. And actually, if you think about it, they don't even want a quarter inch hole. They, they, they want to put their IKEA uh, cabinet on there. And then when they, that IKEA cabinet is there, they feel uh, calm because they can organize their stuff. Maybe they can tell to their wife, look how amazing it looks. They can feel proud of themselves. So it's about how it makes them feel and, and what it achieves for them. So it all starts with the customer. So you need to understand what are their problems, their pain points, their jobs to be done, desires, needs, and fears, and how will it make their lives better? So this is a very nice model actually from Finn's Law, which helps with doing that. So if you look, this is called the game analytics framework. And, and, and I didn't come up with this. This is just a pure coincidence. Uh, I didn't pick the gaming examples because of this. So basically, if you understand what your users are trying to achieve in your product, their goals, then you can take a look at your product, what actions are going to lead uh, to those goals. And then if you understand that, you can connect metrics. And then ultimately, you can evaluate, hey, are people achieving their goals in our product? And if they're not, why not? And that's something metrics don't show you. So you, this is not enough, but at least it can give you an idea of what is going on. And then the key thing is you need to talk to your customers and understand what are they doing and to understand why it's not working for them. So let me uh, give you an example from uh, Picnic. So Picnic is a Dutch company and they're actually doing super well. So what's very interesting is what they figured out is, so to give you some context, if you're not Dutch, Picnic offers online groceries. So basically deliver it to your house. And what they do understand really well is people do it to save time. Like that's a, one of the big reasons. So they also communicate this in their marketing. But what's also very interesting in their products, they actually try to develop features to help uh, deliver this benefit. So let me give you an example. What they measured is um, how long does it take for a user to complete their checkout? Because somebody is going to look uh, at what they can buy and they're thinking, oh, I need milk, I need eggs. So they actually built some kind of recommendation algorithm based on your past history. And you looked, what is, what is the impact of that on the time it takes to complete your checkout? And they were able to reduce the, the checkout time significantly. And this is an example of tying this user benefit to actually something actionable. Because if people spend less time adding stuff to their cart, that's great. They have more time to do other things. So this is a very nice model from Melissa Perry's uh, The Build Trap. Uh, it's a very nice book. I can recommend you to read it. So basically, if you look at it, it all starts with your customer. But what you shouldn't forget is, ultimately, you do, you do need to capture that value somehow. But if you're not delivering value to your customer, then you're not going to be able to capture that value. So to go back to another example from gaming, so Duke Nukem 3D, right? Why was that game uh, a success? So what's very interesting is, so Duke Nukem Forever, which was actually a game they made later, was a total failure. Duke Nukem 3D was a massive success. So why was it a massive success? So when they started Duke Nukem 3D, they actually built it with last year's technology. They knew when they would bring it out, it's going to look not as pretty as other games that were coming out. They accepted that. They were like, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be groundbreaking from a visual perspective. But we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on making the game fun. And that's all they did. So they did a lot of play testing. And for example, Duke Nukem, uh, this character was one of the first characters which had really interesting dialogue and a, and a character like making jokes. 
So this is one of the big reasons the Nukem 3D became a success. And then if you look at Duke Nukem uh, Forever, uh, why it was a failure, they were really focusing on the flash and the glitter. So every time there was a new game coming out, like Quake 3, they were like, oh, we need to switch engines. Let's do Quake 3. So they actually switched from Quake 2 to Unreal to a newer version of the Unreal. They were all focused on the features. And they were not thinking about how can we make this game good? And yeah, let's be honest, most of you, I don't know who plays games, right? You don't know the engine and you don't care as long as the game is fun. So next time you build something, ask two questions. I think this is the key thing, is it good enough? And the other question is, how do we know is, it is good enough? And the better you are at answering these two questions, the better you can make your products. And to relate this as well, because I've been writing recently a lot about road mapping. So what I can really recommend is if you join a new company or you're interviewing, or you're actually currently working at a company, take a look at the roadmap. The roadmap is very telling towards the philosophy of a company uh, towards living features. So to give you, I actually coined this principle, I called it the penguin principle. So it's based on the Peter principle. Uh, basically road, roadmaps reflect the level of agile inadequacy. So why is it called the penguin principle? It's because there is this story and maybe it's an urban myth, right? But I like the story um, that penguins actually push each other in the water. Uh, so penguins are standing on the ice and then they're worried, is there a seal or an orca in there? So what they actually do is they push one penguin in and then if the, the, the ocean becomes red, then they're like, oh, the coast isn't clear. And if the ocean is blue, then it's safe. And um, that's why I think with roadmaps it's the same. You, it really provides an adequate indicator of the state of the agility of an organization. And wait, I, uh, yeah. So what's really important is use the right road mapping approach. So as I explained earlier, it's about this balance, what I call like afterthought and, and foresight, the right balance. So acting based on what you know at this moment and responding based on what you discover or learn. And that's the key thing. And if you look at a roadmap like this, so this is just an example. It's all, uh, I unfortunately removed the quarter. So you gotta believe me, this is a roadmap for one year. Every feature is specified on a specific date. And it's all, you already know how it's gonna work. But the only problem is what, there's no room for learning. There's no room for experimentation. Uh, maybe you deliver the autosave and it doesn't deliver the expected value. Will you still work on the autosync? Maybe not, we don't know. So this, that's the biggest problem with these kind of roadmaps. And what I usually see, what most companies do, and as I said before, I believe this is probably due to our education or a fear of making mistakes. We're actually making too many plans and too elaborate plans and, and uh, writing out with too much detail our actions. And that means you're overfitting. So you're, you're making plans based on noise. And uh, yeah, you're rubbing your crystal ball. That's another way of putting it. And you can see this with Scrum teams that are in a meeting room for four hours during sprint planning. Uh, I think you can do it in one hour and maybe even half an hour. It's all about how flexible are you to adapt what you learn during the sprint. And another example, but I, I'm not saying, right, you shouldn't make any plans. That's not what I'm saying, because the, the counterpart is winging it, right? Making no plans, no actions, that will also get you in trouble. But what I do want to say is, uh, it's very important that you make your teams feel safe. And, and it's maybe better that you have a sprint where there is some winging it because people are scared of making mistakes. They, they assume, over assume how accurate their plans are gonna be. And uh, I think we can, we can adapt way better than we believe we can. So that's why I want to offer you two challenges if you want to try this out. And it's, I know it's gonna be scary and maybe it also depends on your context, right? If you're working on a crazy, scary risky project where if you don't deliver it uh, you're going to lose your neck but start a sprint with just a sprint goal i've done that before and just see like make the backlog during the sprint uh, of course you need to make your team feel safe but you will find out that you need far less planning than you think you need and as well during a retrospective ask different questions what i notice is very often in retrospectives whenever something goes differently than expected the question is what did we miss? What can we learn from it? But I think a much more useful question is, how can we get better at learning from these 
these mistakes or these, these things we couldn't know yet. Because this flexibility you're always going to need. There are always going to be mistakes and there's always stuff you don't know before you start. So yeah, the most important takeaways, I believe you won't be able to deliver in time or ever be able to deliver it exactly as initially specified. What matters most is when you deliver something, how sure are we that this was going to be good? I would really recommend, and I can also send the article, read about the game analytics framework. It's a very powerful tool to look at your metrics through this lens to see whether it's helping your customer do their job better or help them achieve their goals. And when you have a road mapping approach, carefully examine it because your approach can really impact the amount of learning or discovery or experimentation that is possible. The more that's written in stone, the more you're doomed to be a feature factory where you're just like, okay, we need to deliver this in this date, let's go for it. There's no room to adjust or adapt. And making all these plans and all these tasks comes really natural. It's what we learn in school, try to let it go. Leave some, make, create this psychological safety, allow for mistakes and, and incorporating stuff as you learn more. And as I said before, try to plan a sprint with just a sprint goal, just as an experiment to see how much plans do you need and, uh, and worry about how your team is able to respond to changes. Thanks for listening. This is one talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'm curious if there are any questions. Wow, thanks, Martin. Absolutely fantastic presentation. Always love hearing you. You always have a very engaging style. This is quite a treat. So we have someone like Martin and we've got 30 minutes remaining for open floor to ask questions. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm we'll just open the mic. Talker. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. We'll open the mic if you want to just unmute yourself and ask, or if you're not comfortable or don't have audio, you can always post it in the chat and either Ketrin or I will will ask for you. It looks like uh, Devashi has a question, so go ahead. Yeah, hi, Martin. It was a great talk. I picked up a lot of new insights. It was lovely. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you. I'm based in Singapore. I work for a financial services organization. And I loved your uh, insight about starting a sprint with, with just a sprint goal. And then the team figures out what to do within it. Now, the practical issue that I, I will have if I try to do that with my teams are, you know, financial services, they kind of live on one tool, which is Jira. And in Jira, in order to start a sprint, you need some kind of a backlog. Other than that, the scrum police is going to pick me up and say, oh, you, didn't, you started a sprint and then you changed scope. So I would love to try this out, but do you have any insight? Like if your organization is kind of fixated on using a tool like that, what is a, do you, can you think of any work around how we can possibly do this? This looks like a very cool idea to try. Yeah. So I think you're touching on two important points, right? So what I first want to stress is what I didn't address in this talk is it all depends on your environment as well. So if you're working at a digital agency, and you're working on a fixed price, fixed scope contact, where there's a timeline in it, what I'm saying doesn't apply. You're going to get sued, right? I mean, it, it, you need to be cognizant of the kind of situation. If you're in a highly regulated environment where you need to follow certain steps, procedures, or checklists, then this is also not going to work. But what I do want to say, now to get to your original question, um, so the key thing is, I could be wrong, but this is my memory at least, in JIRA, you have this manage sprint permissions. And usually what you see, only the product owner has this. Is this correct? Is this the, the challenge? Uh, partly that, the Scrum Master also can manage the sprint, but what typically happens is your burn down kind of goes up if you change the sprint scope after the yeah. sprint has started. And what you're saying in this, I will need to change the sprint scope because new things will be added all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. And okay, I make your sense. So basically, it's not a JIRA question. It's more like, how do I get them on board? Like, because they're, they have all these reports. Uh, they're looking at the burndown charts. So basically, what I can say is, and I've also written an article, which I can share. And, and, and I've, I actually think if you have a perfect burndown chart, then you're not doing Scrum right. So... 
you're not adapting, you're not learning. So I can share that because there I put it way more eloquently than I can do now on the spot. What I do want to say is if all your plans and all your actions and all the results are exactly as you expect, right? That either means you're not doing complex work, which means you don't need to do Scrum or somebody is just not, uh, not adapting to changes because following the plan is more important than making changes. So those are kind of the two flavors. And I think it would be, it's really important to engage in a dialogue about this, like what are they trying to achieve with this? Uh, is it control, right? Because the fact of the matter is, if you look at Scrum, it's about transparency, inspection, and adaptation. If this burn-down chart needs to be perfect, then there's no adaptation. So it's kind of like a heartbeat that stops. So that's how I would try to approach it. I hope it helps. Great, thank you. Love that explanation. Thank you so much. Martin, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and speak and also them. Also some cool remarks, respond. I think. Uh, Mark, sorry to interrupt. There are also some cool remarks in here, uh, but not only questions. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So Kaylin asks, where do people find clients with a big budget and a goal, but no specific requirement? Yes. Uh, and I assume she's she's giving a, an emoji, a smiley face there. So she's a little bit yeah, tongue in cheek. Yeah. We always yeah. have a clear roadmap of features at the beginning. It can change as needed, but it's largely predefined. Yeah. So I don't know enough about the context, right? But, but I, I can tell you one thing. If you're working as a digital agency, then what I've, I've actually worked at a digital agency where we have this fixed price and fixed contract. So we actually... Uh, had a change process, which was extremely annoying and they hated it. And at some point, because we gained more trust, we were actually move away to an approach where they would be paying per sprint and they would have control over, uh, they had, I mean, their product owner would actually decide what we would be working on. It would be more like a partnership. So I think that's one of the ways you can do that, but that requires trust. That's not where you start, but you can then definitely end up there even with a digital agency. So I was actually working with two scrum teams, I don't know, probably like 1 million euro per year income for this digital agency. And we didn't have this budgeting or anything. Like we basically did what the, their product owner wanted. And of course they maybe had their budget stuff. How they manage that, I don't know, but we had nothing to do with that. All right, thanks. Well, we have some very polite people here, Martin. We have people raising their hands, waiting in line. So Veda, ah, I think fine. you were first yep. in line. Yep. So Veda. Hi, thank you. Hi, uh, Martin. Thank you for the beautiful presentation. Thanks, Mark, for calling me out. And uh, my question will be uh, in my organization. First of all, we are in the digital zone. Um, <clears throat> we are, we have, uh, we are using less, right? Yeah. So we have a single backlog with uh, kind of uh, 12 scrum teams, right? An estimation becomes really challenging or kind of uh, interesting when a different team does the estimation or refinement and another team starts working on it. So uh, is there any, uh, uh, do you have any suggestion on how we can, uh, we, we try a lot of things and we are still, you know, experimenting, you know, maybe, you know, if you have any, any opinion or anything you can yeah. share. So let me ask you a follow-up question. So the estimation is wrong. Why does it cause an impact? So can you, because, because basically, let's say you have a sprint with 10, 10 backlog items and they finish nine. It depends if these nine relate to the sprint goal and there's one doesn't, then the sprint is still a success. So it all depends on what problems does it cause? It, does it cause problem because another team is dependent on this ticket? I need a little bit more uh, okay all right a bit more context is because we are we are working based on you know triple constraint again it's triple constraint into scrum right so we've kind of uh, given estimation to uh, a customer of, of us saying that okay we will complete this within this time this yeah. scope by this time and team a did that estimation yeah realistically i mean in real life team b might be committing might be working based on the commitment that team a made yeah. So I uh, know because anyway, team B was the what the available team. So they kind of were like, okay, we are scrum team. We are also waterfall, and they're trying to, you know, mix and match. And it's really creating a nightmare. And uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I think the obvious solution is <laughs> let the team that does the work estimate, right? Because then the estimate will be different, and there will be buy-in. But I also think even if they estimate, they are they will also make mistakes. 
That's the reality. Like nobody will estimate perfectly. And I think it's super important that, so if you look at Scrum, right? There's a sprint. So the, the number of resources during a sprint is fixed. Scope, uh, sorry, quality is fixed. Um, uh, the timeline is fixed. So the only thing you can vary is scope. And that's the key thing, right? If you don't vary scope, then you're going to vary quality. So this is the kind of conversations you should try to have. But I think the challenging thing is if you have a contract where it says we're going to get this by this time, they're just going to be like, we don't care. It takes longer. You're going to work over hours for us, right? It's in the contract. And that's the key thing you need to change because otherwise there is no interest for them. The only thing you can do is deliver a little bit crappier code. That's the, and that's what happens in my experience. Like you make shortcuts, you create technical depth. You're like, yeah, that's what we can change. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mati. So Martin, I'm going to transition because I think you answered somebody's question in chat, but I'm going to go ahead and post this or go ahead and speak this. So Ale, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, please chime in if there's something different other than what Martin just explained. So Ale asks, number one, should we avoid giving due dates or even worse deadlines? And two, how to manage business expectations when they are more worried about the due date than customer value. Yeah. So the key thing is, so wait, do two questions, right? So uh, can you repeat the first one? So the, the second one was about the due date, right? They're worried about the due date. How do you manage that? And the first question was? Should we just avoid giving, giving yeah. due dates or deadlines? No, I don't think so. So the thing is, the challenge is you need to be, meet people where they are, right? So, I mean, uh, if you join a, a company, they have a certain mindset. They're feature fact. Most of the time, it's feature factories and timelines. Let's be honest. And you can, of course, uh, say we need to do it differently. We need to do that, but nobody's going to take you seriously because you've just joined the company. You don't have credibility yet. So, in my opinion, you always need to meet meet them where they are and slowly try to make changes. And uh, what I think is really important is if you need to give timelines on features only give timelines on stuff you're working on now, not stuff you're going to do later. Because if you have a roadmap of nine months and your first estimate is wrong, then everything else is going to shift. And then for nine months, you're going to get uh, whipped by people that you're not delivering, you're being late, you're doomed from the start. That's what you should never do, in my opinion. So, and of course that's difficult, but I think you can explain it, right? So for example, I'm, I'm currently busy uh, with a very big project. And I got a lot of pressure from stakeholders. We want to know when it's done, this whole project. And I told them, I cannot give this timeline. I can't. I mean, I can rub my crystal ball and do it, but you're all going to be super unhappy. So, because I'm not going to make this timeline. I simply don't have the information. And, and, I, try, I, and, and I explained it with the weatherman example. And I said, this is what I can do. We're going to make a very small slice. I'm going to give a timeline for that. And when we have that slice, then I can give timelines on other things. And then we'll also have better information. And if you want to pull the plug, because I think it's going to be twice as much work, we can do that. And um, this is how I try to manage it. Don't give uh, timelines for a huge projects. Try to give timelines for smaller chunks first, and then give timelines for the other things, because you will be in a far better state. Uh, often you need to do CICD, infrastructure, all these kinds of things. You need to have this foundation, especially when you do something new. If you don't have that, that's so much uncertainty. Uh, you're going to be wrong, period. So do provide forecasts, like I said in the talk, and update them as you learn more. All right, thanks, Martin. Ali, I hope that answers your question. We're going to get to some more. So Ryan has been very patient. Ryan, go ahead. Thanks. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. So, so great presentation, Martin. Um, you've written about simplified roadmaps, essentially like yeah. a now, next, later. So yeah. this is something that I've, I've adopted a variation of this using Jira and Confluence to get the kind of same view. Um, but I find stakeholders always want more and yeah. more like the view that you shared in your presentation. So do you leverage any other roadmaps? Have you taken any other approaches to help stakeholders with that bigger view or do you stick to that now, next, I really later try approach? to stick to that. So I do agree with you, right? Uh, you need to have a lot of conversations and explain why. And it, it's very difficult. Uh, but uh, I stick to that view. But what I do do is in Jira, you can add this due date, right? So I do provide forecasts. But the thing is, 
it also depends on the, the kind of trust you have with your stakeholders, which you need to gain, right? If I join a new company, I'm only going to give a timeline for what I'm working on at the moment. But if I feel that they understand that there's uncertainty, they, they can handle that and they're not going to pressure me and say, oh, first it was this and now it changed. And then they're going to bully me with that. Then I'm fine with giving uh, uh, this forecast. And then I also think if, if it really helps them, you can make this Gantt chart, which makes them super warm and fuzzy inside. But the key thing is, as long as they respect that it's going to change, then whatever way you display it is cool. But the key thing is what you often see is when they're asking for these gun charts with all these dependencies and these precise timelines, that's because they don't get that part. And that's why usually I don't do that. Great, thank you. All right, Andreas, I think you're next in line. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself. All right, so yeah, thank you, Mark. So yeah, uh, thank you, Martin, for the presentation. So I take a note regarding what's the major most is that, that you're confident about what's the product that you're building is any good that. I want to know that how you want to check because Scrum is about inspect and adapt. Is how about you inspect yourself about that you already confidence that we are going uh, in a good way to provide a good value to our users. So yeah, how do you usually uh, inspect about the confidence level? Yeah. So what's interesting is, so if you look at Scrum, uh, there's a sprint and, and the goal of the sprint is that you deliver a product increment that meets the sprint goal and meets the definition of done. And it's, it's, it's hopefully a step towards your uh, product goal and as well aligned with your product vision. But the key thing is, uh, it's very important that you do a lot of stuff which actually do not directly relate to that. Talking to customers, hopping on calls, um, making prototypes, all these kind of things. That's where I spend a lot of my time, because if you do that, then before you, uh, you, when you start building, you have so much more confidence and, 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 and as well, you can build something super small because you really understand the problem. And what I often see is because there's this extreme focus on producing a product increment that everybody shifts into building and, and, and building is a slow way to get feedback. And it's not the only way you can get feedback. And, uh, this I think is very important. And what I try to do is because I really work with sprint goals and I don't uh, plan 100% capacity, right? So probably like more like 60, 70%. That means there's more flexibility. Sometimes also developers join on a, on a call, uh, a sales call just to get a better customer, customer understanding. So all these kinds of things really help because delivering value isn't about only about writing code. It's super important. But as a team, you're responsible for delivering value, not just the product owner, because I think uh, that's how do you say it? delivering value is so complicated. You cannot put all of that in, a, in, in the lap of a single person uh, or on the shoulders of a single person. So I think that's very important. So, yeah, um, just like a comedian that does a small show, right? Try to think of what, how, how can we build something small, like to see if people are going to use it. Or can we do a prototype? All these kinds of things that gives you a bit more confidence so that instead of changing it after you release it, you already have an improved version before you release it. And yeah, I think a lot of people in Scrum, right? They're like always saying, yeah, that's, that's anti-agile because you're doing stuff before you're building. But let's be honest, you also have spikes to, to decrease confidence. You need to, and I actually think that the, the biggest uncertainty isn't the technical uncertainty usually, it's the value uncertainty. That's the most uncertain thing there is. All right, thank you for the explanation. So Martin, if the number of questions that we're receiving is any indication of an engaged crowd, you're doing pretty well. Lots of I have, questions. I have no reference. Well, I'm happy that I get a lot of questions because uh, I'm always nervous and I talk fast. I'm like, ooh, I'm not talking too fast. <laughs> no, very good. All right. So I want to ask you a question that's next in line here. And I'm interested myself based on some of your posts that you've had. Um, I want to grab my popcorn and just sit back and listen to your response on this one. Okay. Uh -oh. What did your take in release planning or PI planning in SAFE? where businesses would like to know what can be done in a specific period of time. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know my stance, right? I mean, uh, I think it's 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 delusional. That's uh, it's an, I mean, I, I wrote an it's an orchestrated circus to to uh, keep the illusion of control alive, right? Um, I understand it's very satisfying to go into a room and, and make these beautiful charts, but the, the the reality of it is, one month in that plan is no longer going to reflect reality, and then you need to make changes, and then you have safe. Good luck making changes. So um, I think it's it's foolish and bound to fail, and I don't get it at all. Uh, so I can actually give you a concrete example. So the, the, I cannot give more details than this, but uh, I worked at a company where the CTO introduced a road mapping process, which was feature timeline based, huge amount of business cases. I we literally would go into a room for the full day. And then I would also need to, with all product owners for a full day talking about our roadmaps, they would get extremely scrutinized. There were like exact numbers on it, exact timelines, uh, many slides of business cases. And then I would also sit with the CEO and, and I, I would need, yeah, I'm super confident we're going to deliver. Uh, yeah, we're going to make it. Nine months from now, this thing is going to be done. Awesome. Of course, that I didn't believe in that. So I had a lot of discussions with the CTO and we couldn't get on the same page. But what's very interesting is because I've written about roadmaps. So the one of the companies, he was a CTO before where he introduced the same way of roadmapping. They reached out to me and they said, hey, do you want to give a talk to us? We're doing roadmapping wrong. So that was a little victory for me, that at least that, hey, people that are in this, these, these trenches and experiencing all these wrong ways of doing things, they actually, they realize, hey, there is something better we can do, but we don't know how. And I think that's the key thing. Um, nice, thanks. Okay, next up, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Is it Inez or Ines? <laughs> Yes, it is Inish. <laughs> it's not easy to pronounce. So, <laughs> okay, so I have more like an insight, a thing that really worked for me when dealing with uh, product roadmaps. So we, uh, I, on my current company, we really faced the same issue that you know basically happens everywhere: roadmaps, timelines, and we really made a, such a simple change that really was a game changer for us. So what we did is to drop the old roadmap road mapping with you know features and timelines and we switch for a visualization that only gives the the priorities on the outcomes and we never talked about features again but purely um uh, we manage ourselves um uh, focusing only on the outcomes on on the value and this process is very transparent for everywhere, for, for everyone. So the stakeholders are uh, highly engaged in this process and it's clear for everyone why um, um, some kind of outcome has priority over another outcome. And of course, when they have insights because they don't, do not agree, they add that information to, to that visualization. It, and of course that we have forecast for the next um, um, topics to uh, to be worked on, but it's a very it's like a list, a visualization uh, list. Uh, but this change really helped us, and uh, now we don't have roadmaps with timelines anymore. And uh, this was really a game changer for us, and everyone is happy about it. So um, I don't know what you think about this idea, Martin, I, but it no, really worked it's... well for me. I think it's an excellent addition. So what I can say is that's the holy grail, right? Outcome-based road mapping, uh, not focused with specific timelines. Like that's where we all want to get. So, uh, so the key challenge I, I see is how do you get there, right? Uh, so uh, that's maybe something you should be giving a talk about because I think that's uh, super interesting uh, how you get a company that is from features and timelines towards this outcome-based road mapping without specific timelines because that's the key challenge, I believe. Yeah, I mean, uh, transparency and trust that uh, the transparency brings, it's the key, right? Um, if you don't have that, you can absolutely change to this. So we kind of did, you know, um, it was a process. In the beginning, we had both, and we even started with rice sheets and so on. And this was like a process, and naturally and organically, people start stop 
looking into the roadmaps because they were always wrong, right? And then they they start to focus on the um, the outcomes prioritization, and you know this was very a very natural um, process. And but of course this only happened because everyone made a big effort to uh, to turn that prioritization list, you know, very transparent and really to engage everyone to participate on it. So, but it's a process, of course. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Dennis. Well, before our next question, we've got approximately five minutes left. Katrin is going to post a link for a survey for Scrum Masters of the Universe because we want to provide more content that is useful for you. And we want to inspect and adapt as well. So please, it shouldn't take more than just a couple minutes to respond to that survey it would help us a lot. All right, let's see. Let's see how many questions we can get to in the lightning round of five minutes left, Martin. Loving the idea with a goal and a blank sprint canvas. Also trying myself to bring in ideas to be discovered, getting pushback most of the time. How do you get the team on board when they ask, what am I going to code? Yeah. So uh, that's that, I like that question. So the thing is, I understand that there will be some hesitance, what I'm going to be doing. So what maybe starting with a completely blank canvas, that that's so what you also could do is to make it a little bit less scary, start with a proof of concept or one or two tickets, which will inform the creation of the subsequent tickets, right? So this is also what I've done in the past. So make it a little bit less scary. I can understand a completely blank canvas. I also want to stress, it also depends on the maturity of your team. If you have a really inexperienced team and you give them this blank canvas and one hour to come up with an approach, they don't have the experience, right? So that's also something I want to stress. Like they're just gonna be thinking, uh, oh, how the hell I'm gonna pull this off? You need some senior people in there as well that have built some things, seen some things so that they can guide a little bit in this, this, in this uncertainty. So um, I think that's what I would do. Maybe then try something less radical and as well create a psychological safety, right? Tell them, hey, if you completely fail, that's okay. Like, then at least we can have a talk about what did we learn? Maybe this was too much. Uh, so that's what I've done, actually. I've been in situations where I joined a new team. There was nothing, no sprint backlog, no product backlog. And I was like, okay, this is the most valuable thing. This is the goal. Let's get started. If we completely fail, uh, that's cool with me uh, because we're working on the most valuable thing. And I think if we fail, then we have valuable information about what are the kind of problems or risks that we're facing that we need to, to face. So that's also a big win because usually you, when you just start creating tickets and doing spikes, it takes many more weeks before you discover the biggest problems. And a follow-up question, which is very similar. I should have linked these two together. Abhishek asks, wouldn't we have small sprint planning with the sprint if we just started if we just start simply with a sprint goal, won't it create confusion every day? So the thing is, you still have sprint planning. You set a goal and you can just create one ticket. And I, as long as everybody feels like we, we think we're able to pull this off, then what is the confusion? If you know what you're trying to achieve and why, then if there are uncertainties or you can resolve that. You have the daily scrum. You can talk about, hey, I did this. I don't know how to do this. So these are just conversations that you need to have. But I think it, it, it uh, how do you say? It also depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, if you set an extremely ambitious goal, uh, then they're not going to feel safe. So you need to think about what is a what is a small goal where they're like, yeah, we think we can do this. And then if they have time, they can always do more. That's the point. It's not only flexible when you achieve the sprint goal, it's also flexible afterwards. So set a small goal and then there will be far less uncertainty. And then if you meet that goal, then you expand it. You don't, I mean, that's what I try to do as well. And when you said the team's not going to feel safe, you meant capital S-A-F, lowercase e, right? Just yeah, exactly. kidding. Couldn't, <laughs> couldn't resist. You lofted that one up for me. I knocked it out of the park. All right, well, you still got a number of questions, but we're out of time. So I wanna respect your valuable time, Martin. Um, I'm fine with answering some questions unless other people have to leave, right? I mean, everybody can leave. Uh, 
I'm okay, cool great. This. We'll continue going as long as Martin hangs in there with us. Yeah, Kids like start busting down minutes. the door. We'll know it's the babysitter has been overtaken. Oh, like five or 10 minutes is okay. <laughs> okay. All right. What's your take on velocity as a productivity metric and a measure of estimates? How many sprints can a team deliver on the features is from Giron. Yeah. So the thing is, um, I think the key thing about the problem with velocity is the moment you start focusing on it, then people are going to game it. Like they can just easily think, oh, 50 story points, last sprint. So we're going to make this eight a 13 and this five and eight. And oh, now our velocity is higher. Everybody is happy. So I really think that focusing on velocity, you get all of these kind of anti-patterns. Another anti-pattern is focusing on velocity means people will obsess over finishing everything in the sprint which I don't think is the goal, like, because that means they will make shortcuts on quality. And of course we have a definition of done, right? But, and even if they don't make shortcuts, it means they're gonna be working over hours, which isn't sustainable. So in all cases, I think obsessing over velocity is not a, not a great idea. I think what makes may more sense is looking at your cycle time, seeing what you can do to make tickets uh, or, or backlog items smaller, these kind of things. Uh, see where the bottleneck is, right? So there's always a step that's the bottleneck and that's that's the step you need to improve because any other step that doesn't lead to a speed improvement. So worrying about those two things, like what is your bottleneck and what is the cycle time and which steps take the longest, if you want to improve efficiency, that's way more important than velocity. Excellent. Let's see, so I'm trying to get to some, I'll just go ahead and ask this. This is kind of a long question. Uh, Marshall asks, in a closed contract, how do you balance the iron triangle, scope, time, and cost with this philosophy? Possible yeah. options are losing money, delayed delivery, as we have seen, as long as we are allowed, losing yeah. money on both sides, reducing functionalities, would the client accept it? Yeah, so that I think this is, so I've been in, it's a delicate balancing act. So the thing is, when you have a fixed price contract, what you usually see is the first contract, you're losing money. That's what I usually see at least. So the first contracts, because you need to win the deal, right? And there are many people that want to win this customer. You lose money guaranteed. That's what I often see, because first of all, you're gonna make a lower offer to win the deal. And then when you win the deal, even your original estimate was completely wrong. So you're going to lose even, lose even more money. So what I usually see is the subsequent contracts, they become more realistic because you have a bit more information. You have a team that is working together. You maybe have a foundation. And I think the key thing is uh, don't be too specific in your contracts. Give you some wiggle room. That's the most important thing. Like, of course, in contracts, you, you want to nail everything down. But then the problem is you're not going to have wiggle room. And then they're, they're just going to point to the contract and say, this has to be in there in this way. And you get all these nasty discussions. And yeah, I think that's, that's I think, the most important thing. Uh, um, what I can say is the challenge is even if it's not in the contract. So I can give you a concrete example. Uh, I was building an e-commerce website and they're paying a lot of money for it. And nowhere in the contract it specified there needs to be Google Analytics. So nobody thought about this. This is a very pathetic mistake, I have to admit, right? But you have to admit it's like seven years ago or something or eight years ago. So um, the customer said, even though it isn't a contract, we're paying you as professionals. This is foundational, basic stuff. You missed it. You're responsible. And then, of course, you can point your finger and say, hey, it's not in the contract. But come on, like... Uh, there's also something as preserving the relationship and they won't take you seriously if you're like, yeah, it's not in the contract, so we're not doing it. Their point was entirely reasonable. So at the end of the day, it's important communication and maintaining this relationship. And no matter what's in the contract, you always need to keep the customer happy. So they always have a little bit of power because in the end of the day, they can always say, screw you, screw you guys, we're going for another company. So yeah, it's challenging. You've had a couple of people asking about details about your upcoming book, Martin. You want to say anything more about that? 
Yeah, so what I can say is it's not going as fast as I hoped. Uh, I became a dad uh, two months ago. It was a bit more impactful than I expected, but uh, it's, it's looking really good. And if you have any questions or want to know more, feel free to reach out. But uh, uh, yeah, so far, um, I truly really try to tell it with storytelling like I did now, uh, nice examples. And I, uh, and I hope that people will really enjoy it. Awesome. Well, there's no way we're going to motor through the rest of these questions, Martin. Yeah, yeah. So I'll... let's cut it short. So feel free to message me on LinkedIn, Brad, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll answer, try to answer any questions. I want to thank you for all the questions. Like, I really appreciate the, all the, 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 how do you say, interaction. And uh, thank you. Awesome. Well, we were very honored by having your presence here, Martin. Great presentation. Thank you for opening up to us and answering questions. So many questions. Thanks to our group for being engaged. So we really appreciate it. All right. Well, we're going to wind down and wrap this up. Going to stop the recording here and then Jamie will be posting this on the meeting.